This is Resilience Quest. It's a game show where players journey to a dystopian future to examine worst case scenarios. It looks unimaginable, actually. Like, even if we have a drought, it usually doesn't last that long. They then travel back in time to champion a way to prepare for the calamity. You will have five minutes to discuss this, and your time starts now. I feel like I'm putting a lot of trust in you guys. Yeah, let's go. So, you know. The team's arguments will be scored by a panel of experts. It's a meeting of minds and a battle of wits to protect Singapore's future. So are you ready? Yes. yes. Welcome aboard our time machine. I'm your game master, Yvonne Chan. Let's meet our travelers. Wearing green, we have Chong Ti, the co-founder of Waterome, a social enterprise that builds portable water filters. And then we have Jolene, the head of business development at Nurasa, a company championing sustainable and healthy food in Asia. And their team captain is social media content creator and presenter, Fauzi Aziz. And your team name is, Fauzi. We are the Teal Titans. Tell us why the Teal <laughs> Titans, which is the correct color of your sweater. Exactly, and also we love an alliteration, so there oh, you go. All right, here, meet the TTs then. <laughs> uh, turning to my left, the team in blue, we have Marcus Ko, an urban farmer who founded the Habitat Collective. And then we have Chu Belong, who is the CEO of Get Solar. And fronting the team is their captain, Man Jing, who is an environmental champion, also better known as Bio Girl MJ. So, MJ, what is your team name? Any alliteration there? Our team name is Blue Double D, inspired by the song. Now, in this episode, we discuss critical resources. Obtaining food, water, and energy is a constant challenge for city-states with very limited natural resources. And our first scenario is all about water. So I just want to ask, are you guys thirsty for adventure? Wow. You saw what I did there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very confident in my team to be able to find the best solution. Okay, so Eve, why don't you take us there? Oh. You've arrived in an alternate Singapore in the year 2065. Due to climate change, it is facing a severe drought. That's right, guys. The reservoirs have dried up, no thanks to a really long dry spell that lasted for over 100 days. And the haze that you see engulfing the city is from wildfires that have spread across the region. How familiar does this scenario seem to you? Um, quite familiar in the sense that, you know, with haze, we've experienced that, but in terms of like, drought, well, I, I have no idea. Severe drought, yeah, more than 100 that's days. That's crazy. It is a very dire situation for this thirsty city that requires about 900 million gallons of water per day. So the water shortage, it's killing citizens, it's killing industries, and because the drought is regional, neighboring countries have also stopped exporting water. And the city-state now stands on the brink of collapse, but there is hope. We have a time machine and you can go back to prepare for this potential calamity. So Eve, let's go. Beware, traveling backwards in time is complex. Answering questions about your destination will help me navigate to your version of Singapore with time to spare. So every correct answer gives you three points. And if you get all questions correct, you get one extra bonus point. Both teams can take part in this. So Teal Titans, Blue Double D, are you ready? 
Yes. 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 Let's go. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, here's the first question. When will the 1962 water agreement between Singapore and Malaysia expire? We have three options for you. A, 2061, B, the year 2062, C, the year 2065. You have 10 seconds to choose and reveal your answers. <laughs> Well, I feel like I'm putting a lot of trust in him. And your time is up. Please reveal your answers. Teal Titans, I see a big A over there. Can't change your answers now. It is an A as well. What is the correct answer, Eve? The answer is A. 2061. This second water agreement entitles Singapore to draw and use 250 million gallons of raw water per day from the Johor River. That's right. So the 1962 agreement will expire in 2061. Let's move on to the second question. By the year 2020, how much of Singapore's water requirements could be met by reclaiming wastewater and sewage? Three options again, A, 20%, B, 30%, C, 40%. Your 10 seconds starts now. Are you 2020? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Are you 2020? Either way. Yeah, I think, um, okay. Yeah, that was my instinct. Yeah. It's the Goldilocks problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, please reveal your answers to me. You chose B. Oh, oh. B2. Oh, oh. Are you guys in sync or what? I'm not, not sure if it's correct, but let's ask Eve. What's the correct answer? The answer is C, 40%. Oh. In 2020, <laughs> Singapore met 40% of its water needs by purifying wastewater and sewage. To cope with growing demand, the National Water Agency aimed to double the production of reclaimed water by the year 2060. So we're quite optimistic there because mm -hmm. we could meet our water needs by 40% using wastewater by then, okay? Let's move to the last question now. You still have a chance, guys. Okay. Local rainwater catchment can meet up to 20% of Singapore's water needs depending on the amount of rainfall. But up till 2023, what do you think has been the longest recorded dry spell in Singapore? A, 22 days, B, 42 days, or C, 62 days? 10 seconds starts now. I guess it's as good as mine. <laughs> I think B. I stay in the east, so usually it, it seems longer. Good luck to us. Okay, no, time is up. Reveal your answers, please. Oh. <laughs> B again? Okay, well, Eve, tell us what the correct answer is, please. The answer is C, 62 days. Oh. The dry spell lasted oh from January 13th to March 15th in the year 2014. Oh Scientists expect climate change to bring extended dry spells in the future. That's right, Singapore went through the longest dry spell of 62 days back in 2014. I know you guys were born by then. So Teal Titans, you've answered one question correctly, which means you get three points. And Blue Double D, you've also answered one question correctly, giving you three points. It is a tie. Eve, let's time travel. Ooh. Oh. You've now arrived in Singapore in the year 2024. That's right, Teal Titans, let's move to the second round. We're at a crucial point for the city to prepare for future water challenges. And we've arranged calls with two experts to offer you two different strategies. So listen carefully. Hi, travelers. I propose water independence. We'll commit to sustainable expansion of water reclamation and desalination, boosting water catchment and storage capabilities, and pioneering innovative technologies to revolutionize water management. Join us on the path to secure, self-reliant water resources for our future. My solution is the Transnational Water Network. We're forging new water contracts with neighboring nations, diversifying our water sources through regional and global trade, sharing water technology to bolster global freshwater supply, and collaborating on an early warning system to combat droughts and dry spells. Join us in building a resilient, interconnected water future that benefits us all. Okay, so you've heard both solutions. We want you to weigh them up and also share the pros and cons of each solution and then explain which solution your team will champion and why. You now have five minutes for your discussion. Mm, yeah. <coughs> so, we'll go for water you can either do one or two, yeah. but I think here what we should discuss is, I guess, just um, 
sovereignty. I'm not sure if this would really work, you know, in actual crisis, you know, to rely on transnational water networks. I wonder what they will choose. But actually, both are already happening right now. I would say from the food security point of view, they also have some relationship with water supply because right. a lot of fresh water has been used for agriculture. Yeah. In the event of a crisis, what is you know the motive you know, or motivation to share with your neighbor, right? right? So that is always a challenge. But you know, as far as now is concerned, mm. to produce energy in Singapore, we also need a lot of water. I wonder if they'll bring up the point about, you know, um, water reclamation and desalination being very energy intensive yes. as well. So even though it sounds like water independence might be a very straightforward yeah. solution, yes. right? there are lots of costs to it as well. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And, and time is up. Well. It is time to present your pitches and each team member will have one minute each to speak. You'll be judged by a panel of experts who will reward you based on the clarity of your presentation, the accuracy of the evidence that's presented, and the overall stylishness or the smoothness of your delivery. So no pressure, guys. Mm -hmm. Teal Titans, are you ready? Mm. Yes. yes. All right, let's yeah. do this. Your time starts now. Who will go first? Yeah, water independence is definitely very important for Singapore. Um, we are talking about um, when there's climate change, we are not looking at just dry spells, you are looking at um, periods of extreme rainfall and that rainfall usually gets wasted you know, when it gets run off into the, into the ocean and then during the dry spells, if we don't conserve sufficiently, it will be a big problem for us. So we have new water now, that is a very effective way of reusing the water and recycling the water, um, but we can definitely expand on our ability to store the water. So what we are, our plan is to spongify the city so that we can trap as much water as we can so that during the rainy season, we can store as much water as possible using the natural uh, flora and fauna of Singapore, especially with our warm weather and rainfall, it's perfect for us. And um, during periods of emergencies, we'll have um, desalination plants that can purify the water from the sea. That's the emergency source. And why it's very important for us is to make sure that we have hybrid systems. So because you know, we know that desalination is an extremely energy intensive process. So in order for us to be um, water secure, we want to okay, be able I'll to... I have to stop you there, right, Chongti. Sure. Yeah. So you are pitching for the water independence and really gunning for rainwater recycling and more independence there. That's right. Okay, let's move on to Jolene. Hmm, yeah, I think one of the things that we were thinking about is why uh, water independence would be more important to us than transnational water networks. Um, I think they're both important, but with a transnational water network, we've just experienced COVID and we know that in times of exceptional difficulty or ex uh, circumstances, we need to ensure that the negotiations were done well enough to protect our own rights as well as our needs um, and to ensure that the, de the devil in the details of these water contracts will allow us to still get the water that we need um, if other countries are going to be in a situation where they need to protect their own um, and also to understand the capabilities we need to honour these contracts and make sure that the water duration of the contracts, uh, the quality and all of these things would actually be good for us. Like you said, the devil is in the details, mm -hmm. making sure all the nitty-gritty is covered. And let's move to Fauzi then. Well, who can we rely on other than ourselves, right? That's, I think, one thing that we must be very certain of. I mean, in times of need, who are we, who, who's going to help us but ourselves? So I think uh, that's something that I think we want to push for, and that's why we wanted to go for water independence. Uh, but at, with that said, I think we also acknowledge there is a, a value in kind of combining different strategies, and definitely we're not closing ourselves off to the idea of you know, a transnational water network. And I think Singapore has been very successful in you know, doing that, like now. Right, we have the four water taps. Uh, we have our you know new water plants. We have our uh, water catchment areas. We import water as well, and all these things are something that Singapore has been very successful in doing. And in fact, what we can do is further expand using technology to expand uh, our capability of you know getting potable water and usable water for our residents in Singapore. So to ensure water security then, your priority, the pitch that you're championing is still water independence, but still being receptive to a transnational water network. Am exactly I right? Exactly that. Okay, that's a really interesting pitch. I wonder what the judges have to say about teal titans. <laughs> I like the idea they mentioned about COVID. 
You know, that's uh -huh. this uh, really a, a test. Yeah. You know, when all the resources and everything is under stress, then how do we protect ourselves? Yeah. Right? Yeah. That is a good idea. I think maybe some more examples could have been shared. Mm. Um, I like the idea of the sponge city, so sort of decentralizing and actually capturing as much water as we can, which is already the case now. They had a very reasonable response to think about, you know, the two scenarios, right? And these yeah. two solutions as not being separate from one another, mm. that, you know, as with what the government, I think, now is actually pursuing, mm. both strategies are important to maintain for longer-term interest as well. Mm. Yeah. If we are now looking to the future, mm -hmm. so a little bit of imagination and creativity, the creative thinking should also come along. Yeah. So this is something that being a young, you know, a future generation, mm. uh, yeah. that will contribute to Singapore's uh, water supply, I think that maybe can come up with some daring solution. Right. If you don't have enough energy to go around, then maybe you should look at other solutions. Well, the judges' verdict is in, and Team Teal Titans, you've scored 65 points oh. out of a possible 90 points, oh, OK? Know, okay? And I just okay. want to give you okay. a couple of lines from the judges. So they felt that your arguments were pretty clear, and they liked that you mentioned uh, COVID, right? Because that was really a test on the city-state's resilience during that time. But what they really wanted to get more out of Teal Titans was wilder solutions, more creative ideas, right? Rather than just leveraging on what's already being done in Singapore. So let's try to be a little more creative in the upcoming rounds. Okay, but that was a great effort overall. Now coming up next on Resilience Quest, we will see how Blue Dubba D takes on the energy shortage. Yeah. Welcome back to Resilience Quest. It's time for Team Blue Dubba D to confront the energy crisis. So ready yourselves for the journey? Eve, take us there. You have arrived in an alternate Singapore in the year 2050. The city faces rolling blackouts as it's short of energy for power generation. A global energy crisis has left it short of fossil fuels like natural gas, its key energy source. So what do you make of this scenario? Do you think it could possibly live without energy? I think we see how a lot of our industries and our power generation plants actually rely a lot on energy. Um, this looks very dire. I think it would really happen if we don't find an alternative source in time. And how good are you guys with, you know, starting a fire from scratch? Oh, not too bad. I highly <laughs> doubt it. I'm very good at starting really? a fire from scratch. Before? Yes, I'm very handy. Well, in this alternate reality, Singapore's transition to new energy sources has been pretty patchy and also largely inadequate. The good news is we're on a time machine which will allow us to go back in time to better prepare for this eventual energy shortage. Beware, traveling backwards in time is complex. Answering questions about your destination will help me navigate to your version of Singapore with time to spare. So here we go again. Every correct answer is worth three points. And if you answer all three questions correctly, guys, you get one bonus point. So both teams can take part in this trivia round. Are you ready to play? Yes. Let's, go. Let's go. Okay, Blue Double D, Teal Titans, here is your first question. In 2023, how much of Singapore's electrical energy was generated from natural gas? Three choices, A, 74%, B, 84%, C, 94%. 10 seconds, your time starts now. How do you say something closer to this? You look like you have the answer yeah. already. We're ready. Where's the import? LNG or including this? And please reveal your answers to us. Oh, it's C, uh, C, oh, more than 94%. Man. Eve, what is Not the correct anymore. answer? The answer is C, 94%. In the first job, half guys. of 2023, Singapore generated over 94% of its electrical energy from natural gas. Most of this is piped in from Malaysia and Indonesia. 
So I'm hearing echoes of that was easy. Let's move to the second question. We shall see. According to the Energy 2050 Committee report conducted in 2023, what was concluded to be the main fuel that will power Singapore in 2050? Three options, A, natural gas, B, nuclear, C, hydrogen. Give us your answer in 10 seconds. Just a report the same thing, guys. Oh, no, what's up, Jen? Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. I didn't read over <laughs> Yeah, but I said that. And uh, time is up. Please reveal your answers. It's oh, C yeah, for yeah. hydrogen. <laughs> C for hydrogen. Eve will give us the correct answer, won't you, Eve? The answer is C, hydrogen. Yay. The report said low carbon hydrogen could dominate Singapore's energy mix by 2050. Hydrogen would be part of the nation's aim to achieve net zero carbon emissions. That's right. Hydrogen was likely to dominate our energy mix by 2050. It could help in many other areas, such as power generation and also in the transport industries. Time for the last question. In the early 2020s, Singapore made plans to import how much of its total electricity from its neighbors by 2035? A, 20%. B, 30%. C, 40%. 10 seconds starts now. There are some hesitants there. Your time is up. Please reveal your answers to us. B. See, oh, no. okay, the first time that there are different answers, Eve will put us on the right path. Oh, no. This is, this is nerve wracking. The answer is 30%. Singapore made plans to import up to 4 gigawatts of low carbon electricity by 2035, making up around 30% of Singapore's projected electricity supply then. So we've had a bit of a game shifter there. Team Blue Dubba D, you've answered three questions correctly, which means you get a total of nine points. And because all were correct, you get an extra bonus point. Good job. And Team Teal Titans, you've answered two questions correctly, giving you a total of six points. Eve, let's time travel. You've now arrived in Singapore in the year 2024. Well, we've come to the second round, and the city needs to prepare for future energy challenges now. So we've arranged for two specialists to speak with you, once again, offering two very different strategies. So listen carefully. Hi, travelers. My solution is energized by tech. It focuses on adopting new energy technologies to diversify our fuel sources with clean hydrogen and maybe nuclear. This will reduce our dependence on imported natural gas. We'll also strengthen our energy storage capabilities to ensure a reliable and sustainable energy supply. Hi team. I propose a green energy alliance. We'll unite regional energy grids, invest in global renewable projects, and forge partnerships abroad. Together, we'll shape energy policy, drive research, and fuel innovation for a cleaner, more sustainable future. Join us in leading the charge towards a greener tomorrow. And you've heard both solutions, energized by tech and the Green Energy Alliance. So do weigh them up, share your analysis of each solution, highlighting the pros and cons, and then also telling us which solution you decide to champion and why. You will have five minutes to discuss this and your time starts now. Okay. So I think this is tough. Um, and I think both hydrogen and nuclear at this point in time are still like technologies which are not fully proven out yet. Actually, uh, this is going to be a very difficult choice. <laughs> right. You see, it's, it's almost like water. Right? First one is yes. all about yourself, right? Independence. You go as much tech as you can, go for independence. This one, basically you subject yourself to the regional geopolitics again, right? Try to rely on others. Yeah, so there are risks involved There'll be risks. Well. You look at the ASEAN and the ASEAN gas pipeline, right? It's still bilateral arrangement. We do not have a multilateral trade framework. So whether that will work, well, you, you know, there's a question mark. I think having more options is a, is a key. Uh, yeah, so we don't rely on one single source. Uh, on skill source. We, we are... Can you start this and your time is up. Please conclude your discussions. Blue Dubba D, each of you will have a minute to speak. And who will be going first? Player I'll one. I'll go first. Okay, Belong. 
off you go. Yep. I mean, so we are rooting for CART2, a green energy alliance. Primarily, the premise of it is really Singapore. One of the things that we have to admit is that Singapore is extremely energy dense, right? A lot of population, very little land. Um, in order for us to meet our energy needs in the longer term, we inevitably have to diversify. Um, I think especially when we're looking at kind of like a future scenario and climate change, a lot of issues are going to be happening, not just on energy, but also food, also social kind of issues. And we need to form an extremely close regional partnerships. Um, currently, with our energy sources locally, even if we're looking at kind of the initial technologies maturing, that will probably give us about maybe 20, 30% of our current energy base. Um, and so really kind of reaching outwards, building very strong partnerships with our regional partners is probably the way to go. Right, so there are a lot of Pathfinder projects that's happening right now, but you still need to rely on diversifying the energy sources. So imports of renewable energy sources into Singapore That's with right. our regional partners. Okay, got it, Bolong. Next person going, would it be... Okay, MJ. So the reason why we're not choosing cut one, uh, even though diversifying our imported fuel sources is important and we, Singapore is um, investing a lot in low-carbon alternatives such as hydrogen and nuclear, um, the technology is still very nascent. Uh, there's issues with the timeline when uh, to see whether it matures in time. Uh, scalability is also a very big, big issue. So it's a very big risk to put all our um, bets on card number one and we are not sure if we can actually um, fully be self-sufficient in terms of energy needs by 2060. And also there's also issues with land. I think when we think about building like hydrogen plants or like nuclear plants, there's also the uh, issue of land. Uh, do we have enough land for that? Uh, environment concern also, you know, uh, the waste of these products, uh, where, do, where does it go to? So I think with that, we try to, uh, we are choosing card two. Okay, so some important considerations there, especially our land constraints mm. for Singapore. And let's have Marcus wrap up this yeah, presentation. Yeah, so I think we're talking here about a crisis situation. So we need to think a little bit outside of the box in a situation where even potentially the cut to Green Energy Alliance doesn't cut it. Uh, in a crisis situation, what we've seen uh, in, in many studies is that resilience stems from the ability of communities and small-scale uh, and, the, and the reliance on small-scale solutions to solve these problems. Uh, something like that could happen through uh, the ability to harvest energy in human-scale systems, human-scale technologies. And I think um, although Singapore is relying a lot on solar now, we realise that the best solar panels out there and have been there for the longest time are trees. So if we can plant more trees and uh, have the ability for our ecology in Singapore to also be a potential crisis situation energy source, that could increase our resilience where we cannot rely on even our neighbours at all. So I think the last point to add to that is that we might also have to consider reducing our population size. Maybe we need a better ratio of energy and people um, so that I will have to yeah. stop you there. Uh, you had me at reducing our population <laughs> size to deal with the energy shortage. Uh, a very interesting idea, no doubt. And I know our judges are listening really closely now. Let's see what they have to say about Blue Dubbity's presentation. If you reduce population, plant no. more trees, you're actually sending a very negative signal to no, the region. Mm -hmm. Then you say, oh, you want to reduce your demand, so yeah. should we continue to trade with you at a scale? I think, you know, despite the quiz bringing up hydrogen being a possibility, you know, and, and the fact that, you know, I would expect, again, you to be more optimistic about technology being accelerated. Yeah. So I was a little bit surprised that they, they went for option two, which is, you know, again, relying on uh, the region yes. uh, for partnerships and for um, energy projects, right? Which makes sense, um, but at the same time, I think Thing, you know, given so much that Singapore has invested in energy technologies, yes. yeah, I, I would, I'm be pretty, pretty hopeful. I mean, another example they could have used is the, you know, the, the Sun Cable project, right? They want to go from Australia oh, yeah, to yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So rather than cable, maybe you can do hydrogen with a kind of, you know, right, arrangement, right, right. right? So there's also another way of diversifying source if they yeah, want to go for regional yeah, alliance. Yeah. All right, the judges' verdict is in. Blue Dabba D, yes, brace yourselves. You've earned 55 points oh. out of a possible 90 points. And we did receive some really interesting comments from the judges about your presentation. They said uh, the pointers about trees as well as population growth or cutting it down kind of threw them off track a little bit. So some food for thought there to digest. But anyway, coming up next on The Resilience Quest, we'll see how both teams take on the challenge of a food shortage.
Welcome to this final act in this episode of The Resilience Quest. Team Blue WD, you have a current score of 68 points. Okay. And Team Teal Titans, you have a total score of 74 points from the previous acts. Well done, guys. <laughs> So pretty close call there, and this decisive final round is worth up to 150 points, mm -hmm. and it could be your chances to turn things around. Right. So, team, our last worst case scenario in the future revolves around food. Eve, why don't you take us there? It is the year 2050, and extreme weather has devastated farms worldwide and led to a global food crisis. That's right, these disruptions have also hit Singapore hard as the city-state is heavily reliant on food imports. So food shortages and soaring prices have led to social unrest, starvation, looting and worse. What do you guys think of this scenario? It makes me hungry. <laughs> Thinking about the lack it's of food. It's scary, yeah. right? It could be our alternate future in 2050 if we don't do something about it. So to build up the resilience for this food crisis, let's travel back in time, shall we? Eve, let's go. You've now arrived in Singapore in the year 2024. I've arranged calls with experts who will present to you two strategies for Singapore's food security. Welcome travelers. Step into the future with Singapore's 50 by 50 a plan. Building on existing food security strategies, this is a stepping up of our local production to 50% of our nutritional needs by 2050. Singapore shall intensify vertical farming, cutting-edge agritech, and responsible aquaponics, alongside developing sustainable alternative proteins like lab-grown meat and plant-based options. The solution I propose is global food resilience. By diversifying food import sources and strengthening international partnerships, we ensure a reliable and diverse food supply. I also propose strategic stockpiling and the multilateral sharing of stockpiles to prepare countries worldwide for unexpected disruptions. The strategy also calls for the development of new technological innovations that could make global food supply chains more resilient. Thank you, everyone. Now you've heard two solutions, 50 by 50 and the global food resilience. And since Team Teal Titans, you scored higher in the previous round, you will get a chance to choose your solution card and then Team Blue WD, you will choose, well, the card that they did it. So which solution card will you champion? You have 10 seconds to make a decision. Okay, shall we? We'll choose card one. That was really quick. <laughs> so you're going to for 50 by 50. That's right. And Team Blue Double D, you will be championing Global Food Resilience Card Solution. So travelers, you've heard both strategies. Each has its merits and its challenges, and you have chosen your respective solution cards. And unlike earlier rounds, you'll get to critique each other's presentations in a rebuttal. So teams. You now have seven minutes each to discuss how to pitch your solutions and how to critique the other party's presentations. Your time starts now. Oh my god, oh my god. Oh, okay, uh, let's go. Yeah. 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 So, okay. so things okay. like those pulses, potatoes. Uh, so there is we will never. Yeah, so I know. But there's a yeah, you got it. Can. Yeah. Um, not a it's targeting 30. Uh, targeting 30. Yeah. Currently, it's currently it's less than 10. 50 by 50 is a natural progression from 30 by 30. Right. But it doesn't mean that we could not achieve 30 by 30. Here, the key is actually nutrition. Right. So it's not quantity. It's right. all about nutrition. But through urban farming, you can actually adjust a lot of things to yeah. enhance the nutrition profile or right. whatever you produce uh, in the urban setting. So what will happen to the other 50, right? 50 by 50? Interestingly, no country in the world produces all the food they need. Mm -hmm. for the, yeah, even when you talk about big agricultural country like France, uh, USA and China, big producers, they, they also import a lot of food. Right, yeah, right. So it's a global network which makes this uh, 
a food supply, uh, a chain, uh, a win-win situation for all countries. I think looking at the two cards is definitely difficult to make a choice, right, between the two because you realise that 50 by 50, there'll be shortfalls yeah. uh, with meeting that. So I guess you had to revert to, you know, thinking yeah, the about the in, yeah, imports and, and all that and building trade relations, yeah. Let's hope they have some innovative solutions. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Organize, organize the time. And time's up. <laughs> All right, conclude your discussions, guys. Team Teal Titans, you will present first. You will have two minutes to present your pitch. So take it away. Okay, for everyone, I want to get you guys to imagine if you're hungry, what's the fastest way to get food that is locally? Right? So what I want to propose to you is by 50 by 50, uh, we're going to break it down to different food baskets. So food baskets, we have things like fresh veg, we've got fish, we've got eggs. These are foods that you need to be, need to be eaten fresh. And this is something that we would encourage, want to encourage to grow inside Singapore within the city. Now these foods uh, need to be eaten fresh and they provide best nutritional value if eaten fresh. All right, so foods that not necessarily don't, they don't have to be eaten fresh, we can definitely still do import them and that's completely fine. Now, what we can do as well is to expand urban agricultural space, whether it is through, you know, vertical farming or agri-tech, uh, all these localization of fresh uh, foods actually helps also uh, simplify the supply chain and makes it easier for access for the citizens. When we talk about protein, mm. you know, I, that's a very important aspect of our diet. But we are normally thinking of animals. In fact, actually, there's many other ways we can get our protein from. So in our case, our, uh, we can explore plant-based protein, uh, microbial protein, as well as cultivated meat and protein. So this, um, this, this can be produced in a, you know, in, in a very land-scarce Singapore, ensuring that we are still able to get some of these very important aspects of our diet um, through um, you know, science and innovation. Um, very important is that we need to balance the amount of water and energy that's taken for producing this food. But thankfully, um, with, you know, with development in this area, we are able to actually produce them in a very sustainable way. Ultimately, we aspire for Singapore. You know, we are we are a, a country made of people and uh, very smart people in for that matter. So we aspire to be the protein hub, um, you know, and innovation hub of Asia. And there's 250 million people that will need food, uh, need protein in Asia in, in 2030. So imagine that number in 2050. All right, so we are done well before the clock. I like that. Blue Dabadi, are you ready to rebut their presentation? You have one minute to critique their presentation, and your time starts now. Yeah, I think I think trying to produce 50% of our needs by 5050 is very ambitious. I think currently we are already having problems doing 30 by 30, but let's let's go with that a little bit. Uh, a lot of these solutions that you guys are proposing are extremely infrastructure heavy, extremely high tech solutions. Um, yes, we might be producing some of some of our own food locally because of these solutions, but we forget that a lot of the inputs required through these ways of producing food still have to come from somewhere: water, infrastructure, fertilizer, uh, seeds. Uh, if you're doing like lab-grown or impossible meats, we are importing GMO soybeans from somewhere else and there's, that's a problematic situation in itself. So yes, maybe we're not importing food, but we're importing all these building blocks and resources required to bring in food. And if the supply chain is already disrupted, then we can't do that. There's a problem there. Um, extremely high density systems, like even in aquaponics, leads to disease. We see that across I will have to interrupt system. you there, Marcus. One minute is a very short time, but yeah, I do see right. the validity of your arguments. So when we return, we will hear Team Blue WD pitch their solution for a food resilient Singapore. This is Resilience Quest. Welcome back to Resilience Quest. We're in the middle of the final act and Team Teal Titans has presented. And now it's up to Team Blue Dubba D to present your solution. So are you ready? Yes. Of course. Well, Bolong and MJ, I like the energy. Your time starts now. 
Now, Singapore imports more than 90% of our food supply from 180 countries. That's a lot of countries and I do think we have a strong relationship with all of these countries built over many years. For example, when India banned the export of basmati rice, Singapore was actually either the first or one of the first countries that they actually allowed basmati rice to enter our country and that's because of the strong relationship ties we have with them. Uh, and also, I think Singapore has a lot to offer uh, to other countries as well, so they see value in uh, maintaining their relationship with us. So, uh, we have good water technology, we have green finance, we can finance them to invest in better food technologies as well. And not to mention the price of uh, local food production is actually pretty high compared to imports. Uh, 2 to 2.5 2, 2 times when you compare vegetables from Singapore and Malaysia. And I think to have a successful food, resi successful food resilience needs a system beyond Singapore, a uh, fair and strong ecosystem supply chain, and that's including building ASEAN as a region. So if we help other countries in terms of their agriculture and food production, we help ourselves as well. Now, I think if we build on top of that, if we study Singapore's position in the region, right, I mean, we're really good in kind of providing financing, we're really good with technological advancements, and I think these are the strengths that we should continue to build up and rely on as we work across the different neighbours in the region. So I think in terms of really kind of helping and solidifying our position in bringing technologies in terms of increasing agricultural outputs to our neighbours. Singapore is in a really good position to do that. And I think when we're doing that, at the same time, we're also kind of increasing our ownership as well as increasing kind of our involvement in these supply chains to help us build that kind of like security in terms of food imports over the longer term. I will wrap up the discussion right now. Okay. <laughs> so your time is officially up and I will turn to Team Teal Titans. Jolene, I saw you taking notes furiously. Looks like you're ready for the rebuttal. If you're ready, your one minute starts right now. Cool. So thanks for your points. I think one, uh, a few things are very clear. So when we think about food sovereignty and making sure that we can control our own food sources, it's really important that while we have and enjoy food imports like basmati rice and other snacks and food that we enjoy, it's important to have control in times of need and times of exceptional circumstances once again. Not just COVID, we also had a recent chicken shortage in the last two years. And I think that sent a lot of people into panic mode and being able to respond to these require local solutions when others are also struggling on their own. Secondly, the price of production that you brought up was a really good point, but if we don't start today to find new ways of actually producing food, could be technological, could not be, could also be going back to very simple ways of thinking about new forms of agriculture, uh, re redeveloping urban spaces and rejuvenating spaces for different ways of producing food. If we don't start today, we're going to be in a worse position in, in a few years' time as well. Finally, on supply chain technologies, it's really important that we retain the best technologies for ourselves and to maintain the best trade agreements Jolene, I will have to interrupt you there. Time is up, but a big thank you to both teams for playing in this round. Big round of applause for each of you. And now it's time for our panel of judges to deliberate and assess your performance. I think overall, I would say the green team did a better job. You know, comparing you know the presentations and also the later on the debate is is really solid. You know, we understand clearly what their main point is, what their stance, and then they use really good and credible evidence supporting the argument. I'm a little bit torn between the blue and green. I thought you know uh, the green sometimes did pretty well in the rebuttal, and the blue also did pretty well uh, when they started to bring in the evidence. You know, like the case study of the basmati rice, which I, I thought was quite useful in that context. Overall, I think. Uh, uh, I agree with Victor, the green team uh, did a better job. Blue teams, I don't know, it's a lack of experience in the, in the food space or what. There should be some evidence-based yeah, solution. One thing that's missing is that the urban solution doesn't mean it's always uh, more costly, yeah. more high-tech. There are a lot of nature-based solutions that can be uh, translated into urban, urban solutions to actually enhance the the current farming system, which Ooh. is not perfect because it's a linear form of right. uh, economy. And when we talk about urban solution, it's a more like closed loop, okay. uh, a circular, circular economy. The verdict is in. Team Blue Double D, you've scored 65 points for your pitch and 39 points for your rebuttal for a total of 104 points in the final round. Congratulations. Good job. And Team Teal Titans, here's your score. 69 points for your pitch 
and 40 points for your rebuttal oh. for a total of 109 points oh, in the final course. round. Okay, guys, I just want to take this opportunity to share with you some comments from the judges. There was a lot more thought that were given to the pitches, and the solutions presented were also more innovative. They also liked the concrete examples being brought in, especially the basmati rice example. That was a real hit. However, they did feel that Teal Titans, you guys did better in terms of presenting stronger arguments with some solid evidence. And when you add up your scores from the previous rounds, right, round ones and two, Team Blue Double you have a full total of 172 points. And Team Teal Titans, your total is 183 points, which Yay. makes Team Teal Titans our alliteration team today the winner. Congratulations. Okay, well done, guys. This final challenge really highlights the importance of diversifying our food imports so as to increase the number of food supply sources for our tiny city-state. So guys, I hope you've enjoyed journeying with us on this time travel journey on the Resilience Quest. Congratulations, guys. Congratulations. Honestly, I didn't think we would win, but I'm very glad that we did. But I think I really have to give it up to my team members because they carried me all the way to the end. Well, from this experience, I think we all realised that there's no one-size-fits-all solution. Um, there's always benefits and trade-offs if we pick one solution over the other, and it's very hard to just commit to one and forego the other cut. Yeah, it was a great experience learning about not just food, energy and water, but also how they intersect. Um, and from my team members, you know, what the potential solutions might be. And we also really felt the struggle of making choices between uh, different decisions or even uh, at a policy level, but also on a day-to-day -day level, how we can make these choices to stay resilient.